Hello and welcome to this video and on this video I am going to be examining the death of rock. Now of course that title assumes that it is dead and I'm not saying it is dead but I'm going to explore the idea that rock music, the um, cultural phenomenon that emerges in the mid 60s, um, the um, cultural backdrop to m people of my age, a little bit older that we sort of came up in, that that form of music and the values and um, sort of aesthetic um, approaches of that movement is dead. That's what we're going to be exploring here. Uh, this video is going to have the subtitle uh, the Ten Nails in the Rock Coffin. Actually, I think, if I look at my notes, it's the Ten Nails in the Coffin of Rock. Because Coffin of Rock sounds a lot more rock than Rock Coffin, doesn't it? And there that points to a certain flavour or ambience that, ha that rock has. Now that, of course, is still there, but it's often seen now in a sort of postmodernist lampooning um, the uh, values of rock music that were in the 60s seem of incredibly dangerous those can now quite easily crop up in a children's television show with little kids with spiky hair doing this you know so um, we're exploring more than just the musical values on this I'm going to do a series of videos where I explore different things that may or may not have killed rock music. Now of course the viewers for this channel are, are viewers that love rock music and I'm using rock music not as heavy metal but I'm talking about progressive rock, acid rock, psychedelic rock, um, uh, jazz rock fusion, all that stuff I'm going to be exploring of whether that is still a, a living form. Now people can still play music that's from a dead form you know if you if you play Beethoven um, there's nothing wrong with that and people will appreciate it same as you can put on an album by the Beatles and appreciate it but the fact is is with Beethoven you cannot push that form anymore because the form formulas that in which Beethoven was creating his music which at that point was alive are now dead right um, this is a natural occurrence and, and this is something I'm reminded of very very often on um, my videos on the in the comments where people will say, on the one side, you're totally right, Andy, this was awful, it's killed rock music, now everything's terrible, it's all rubbish. There is that aspect, and then there's the other aspect, of it. it's always been the same. And what they really mean is, is that the, the change is the thing that's always the same, that you can't expect music to stand still. Of course, both of those opinions are entirely valid. And people who enjoy rock music and enjoy the actual progressive future thinking, the excitement of rock music, they can uh, mourn the death of that. Looking at modern music, go, well, where's, where's the countercultural aspect? Where's the creativity? Where's the self-expression? All those things can be mourned, and the loss of those things in an artistic movement can be criticised, and an argument can be put forth to bringing it back, you know, um, accepting that music forms move forward. Now, this is a theme I really want to explore on the channel here. And I'll tell you why, because fundamentally I'm a popularist and I want people watching the videos. I put a quite esoteric video up quite recently on Live Aid and I discussed the very specific aspects of Live Aid and how I thought it effect, affected rock music, popular music. Um, and that video did much better than I thought. And I thought there's an interest out there. So let's really explore this. And when I did that video, one of the criticisms I had for that video was, you're just looking at Live Aid as though that was the only cause. And of course I wasn't, I was just exploring one aspect. So let's get into the causes. I have 10 causes. I formed it into a top 10 for you. The 10 events that caused the death of rock music. Doesn't mean I'm saying it's dead. There's nuance here, okay? So, you know, just bear with me. But here are the 10 occurrences that I put out. There's other ones, but I would say these are the top 10. Okay, and I'm going to go through them. I'm not going to rank them, obviously, but they are going to sort of be in a sort of time-based order as I go through them. So the first one I have on the list, right? Um, I'll just expand my uh, screen so I can see all of them. The first one I have on the list is disco. So let's do a little bit of contextual description before we get to disco. Um, popular music was always has always been there, it's the music that most people like, it's music that is popular. The advent of, the record, of recording in the 20th century creates a music industry, and the stuff that becomes popular is quite strange, 
because it, on the whole it's based around Afro-American music. Jazz, blues, country, folk and eventually rap, hip hop, all these forms become immensely popular. Now this is down to the fact that America as a country is like a very influential country and has been very good because of the, the film system it had, the sort of Hollywood film system of pushing out its culture across the whole world, right? Um, so what becomes popular in the world is American music. And by that I mean jazz, blues, rock and roll, rock. Okay, this takes quite a t time to get going and it doesn't really start to happen to the 1950s. Um, after the Second World War, um, there is a lot of rebuilding, there is a lot of change, people start to question the status quo. And the kids that have been born at the time of the Second World War, they become teenagers and they want something different, but they're just teenagers. And that, you know what teenagers want? They want to have fun. They want to something which is countercultural, and they start to look around and they discover it in rock and roll. And rock and roll can be seen as a fusion or personification of jazz, blues, country music, and gospel. You know, all those things come together, but it's all very exciting. And all those songs are about, you know, going out in your car and meeting the opposite sex and going out and having fun. That's what rock and roll is. That's almost like a fad. You know, um, the system that exists before that sort of comes in and we get Elvis Presley emerging. And Elvis Presley is, is the first sort of rock star, he's the first pop star, but he's also a film star. He follows the pattern that's gone before. Okay, this stuff emanates across the world into all sorts of different countries. Now here in the UK, of course, we're an English speaking country, so we um, can take on this. We can, we can make records in the language that is the same as the Americans. It's actually our language, and they had it off us, but then that's another story. And so, in the port cities in the UK, where all these rhythm and blues and rock and roll records coming in, bands start to emerge, namely Liverpool. And the Beatles, here they are my t-shirt, I've worn it again because I knew that they would be so important. The Beatles emerge over in America, Bob Dylan comes out, brings folk. And this rock and roll thing, which is very, you know, sort of um, hedonistic and, and shallow in a way, starts to become serious. Those teenagers grow up and they now seriously want a different world. They're looking for different answers and they look to their popular music and then popular music steps up. Right, and throughout the 60s, we see pop music um, becoming much more uh, intellectual, much more musically advanced, m much more daring, much more countercultural. And the name that gets given to this comes from the old rock and roll name it's rock music. A rock music uh, personifies it's a movie in music which at that time replaces um, Hollywood film as being the sort of central artistic powerhouse on earth right rock music becomes all important and in that it brings up some very avant-garde elements from uh, from non-popular music forms and brings those into the mainstream so we can see when um jimmy hendrix plays uh, woodstock and he plays a Spar star spangled banner on an electric guitar using tons of feedback and effects well not that much effects the effects are all in his hands but you know what i mean using the guitar to create new sounds and he takes something from the establishment and transforms it. And he's really using the techniques of the blues, but much more so he's using the techniques of free jazz. But this, where if you'd had someone doing that on a bassoon in 1962 on some weird jazz album, nobody would have listened. This actually reaches into the culture, right? And so now we get into the 70s and we have this popular form where artists are able to express themselves deeply. And a lot of those records we are very interested in on this channel. And we see the um, emergence of progressive rock and jazz rock fusion, which is sort of the highest form of this very intellectual heavyweight pop limited form in terms of music. We also see the emergence of people like Laura Nairo and um, Joni Mitchell, you know, the songwriters that are intellectually exploring themes that you wouldn't expect in popular music. And all those things cross over, right? Um, the hedonistic, visceral aspects of rock and roll have become lost. Whereas kids used to be going out and having fun and dancing to the music, 
they're no longer dancing to the music. They're, they're sitting in their bedrooms with a big gatefold album, peering into the esoteric meaning of this album while smoking their joints and getting stoned. That's what's happening in the early 70s. Um, and that place for visceral hedonism, it's, there's a market for that. Now, in the mainstream narrative, the thing that comes out and fills that is punk. But it wasn't punk. It was disco. The values of disco were completely different to the values of progressive rock and intellectual rock and kraut rock and all this. But they were also against the values of punk. Punk sheds much more aesthetic DNA with progressive rock than it, than it, than it um, denied. Punk was actually just questioned a certain aspect of it, right? But, in the, but disco, with a disco record, you don't really care who's made that record. You don't care whether they're doing something clever on it or not. You're not particularly interested in the lyrics beyond being able to sing something that's very chanty in the, in the vocal, right? And um, what happens is disco starts to take in all the stuff that's been pioneered in um, especially jazz rock and funk it pummels those in it takes on electronic experimentation which has come from like um, bands like tangerine dream and craft work they're the progressive rock so progressive rock and jazz rock you know they fuel disco but disco brings the sort of um intellectual aspects down and pops up the viscera aspects back up and towards the end of the 70s, every jazz musician is trying to have a disco hit. Um, disco is reacted against by the rockers. The rockers don't like it. And I can remember as a kid watching Baby Snakes, the film by Frank Zappa. And throughout this, there was this whole disco sucks thing. And Frank Zappa was poking fun at disco and, and um, really, you know, paint it as a very shallow form, uh, you know, of expression. And I got to be honest, I love Frank Zappa. And his ability to embrace the counter, the contrarian, I always enjoyed. And I always thought, looking back on it from where I was, because I love disco music, you know, um, there's so much dis many disco records I like. I thought, how could Frank not see this? He seemed like a curmudgeon. You know, he was 38 years old at the time, and he suddenly seemed like a curmudgeon. You know, people started to um, wear badges with disco sucks on it. Um, I... I um, it's, it's a strange one, this is, because disco can be seen as, um, you know, if you take sort of Parliament, Funkadelic, funk, like Headhunters, Earth, Wind and Fire, if you take all those records and then you mix it with, you know, Tantra Dream or Kraftwerk or all those stuff, and the guy that really did this was Giorgio Moroder, the insane thing is, is that everybody wants to get up and dance now. They all want to go out. They don't want to stay at home. They all want to go to a nightclub and dance to a record and they want the DJ to become the centre and they're going to look to the DJ to provide their night, not the band. Um, it's incredible that the thing that's discovered at that time is you can do that electronically and the reason is, is because a machine, um, a machine will sit and play the same thing all night long and a musician, they find that really difficult to do. And so, um, number two on my list, and when I say this, it, it encompasses far more than just what it's describing, because at number two I have the drum machine, but I also mean by that, you know, um, sequencing, um, uh, not so much synthesizers, but the synthesizing of, you know, acoustic sounds, uh, and eventually sampling. It's the machine taking over and the first time we really see that happening is with the drum machine. Uh, now the drum machine was invented to make it easier for musicians. Now why is that? So if you're a rock musician, the technology in the 70s by which you express yourself is through the band. If you want to write songs, you need a band. You have to have a band. You have to form a band and the band has to act as a cooperative and they have to compromise. And the way they compromise is, is by taking the innovations that have been um, developed in jazz. Okay, So this is um, bringing your individual voice to the fore, having your own say but being able to compromise and work with other people that are all having their say. Uh, the great bands are a compromise and they're wonderful because it's all these slightly different aspects all coming together to form something new. That technology is very important. But if we look right down on a basic level at um, what's going on in a band, 
in the 70s, if you just wanted to demo a song, you're going to need a band, right? And the worst bit of having a, a band, right, because you might be able to get some sort of reel-to-reel -reel and stick it in your living room and plug a guitar and record yourself, record, but you'll need some drums. And if you write anything commercial, the beat is so important. In the 70s, drummers like Bernard Purdy emerged because these drummers could play on a record and they would make it a hit. Their personal groove, their individual groove, would make the record sell. Um, so you need a beat on there, but who can record a drum kit, especially back in the 70s, where you need, you know, quarter of a million quid's worth of, uh, or quarter of a million dollars worth of gear just to record a drum kit. So what you had is you had small studios and you had session drummers, and session drummers would be able to go to a certain point, and at one point they might be turning up to do a big album um, session, another time they might be recording a jingle, these all needed drummers, and they would be turning up to demo. Most of the work session drummers did on a low level was demoing. There's lots of demoing going on. Well, if you could create a drum machine, you could stick that in your living room, you could plug your electric bass into your reel-to-reel, -reel, you could plug your guitar in, and you could do the whole thing yourself. But what no one realized when they invented the drum machine is that the general public, in a way, preferred that to the real drummer. Right? Now, you could argue with that and go, oh, no, I love a good drum beat. And what about Led Zeppelin and John Bonham sounds amazing if that had been a drum beat? That's not the point. The fact is, it's by the 80s, late 70s, 80s, people are having hit records, huge hit records, with a drum machine. That takes the drummer out. Then you get in, in great, you have like the Robin 505, was it, that did bass line. Now the bassist is gone. If you're playing a keyboard, then MIDI comes out. You could start to program and sequence keyboards. Suddenly there is no requirement for a band. Right, if we put disco together where the, if there is no interest in the band anymore, you know, people just want to dance and have fun, and then you've got machines playing the music, this is the first two great big nails in the coffin. Um, Disco is going to come and turn into dance music. It's going to get like machinified. It's going to turn into house music. House music by the end of the 80s is going to take over. And every single town is going to have a place in there where people can turn up and dance. And there might be 200, 300, maybe 500 or 1,000 people in that room dancing on a Saturday night. And the poor live music venue is now finding that there's only like um, 20 or 30 people turning up. Now... Initially, that's counteracted by the punk movement. And what the punk movement is, is holding on to the live band and, and removing all the, the entrance by virtuosity. So we, let's just bring in people. And so um, here in the UK, especially, we have this scene emerge at the same time as disco, which keeps alive the, the live venues. Um, when I got to my early teens in the uh, sort of early 80s, still you could go down into my town and there'd be 100, 150 people turning up to see a live band. They were all punk bands. It was all very exciting and countercultural. And you knew there was a division between those people and they in, in, eventually went into indie and all that type. And then the normal people who were going out and just dancing, you know, to Michael Jackson records or whatever it was, you know. Um, and some of those had real drummers on, but as the 80s continues... They turn into machines and then suddenly, mid-80s, house music emerges, it gets taken on and very slowly that culture emerges of uh, an actual music scene. And this music scene operates different to how the rock scene emerged. If you were in a rock band, what you had to do was form a band, rehearse in your garage, try and record some demo, save up and do a de demo at your local you know, studio send that off to a record label, and then they would provide all the money required for you to go into a proper studio and, and record your album in there and, and then press your album, put it out and distribute it, and then they could market it. That's what they were doing. Once uh, disco and the machine come together, you can now have a hit record, and this emerges in the 80s. What you need to do, it's very simple, is you buy a drum machine, you buy a sequencer, you program the track, Right, and then once you've got that track, you can go and press 50 white labels. And if you're in with the DJs, you can hand those records to the DJs and they can play them. And the DJ can be seen to be cool because not only are they playing something new, that they're playing cutting edge. If you had a contact with 50 DJs that were playing in decent clubs, maybe to say to a thousand people, 
and you gave them that track and they played it Friday and Saturday night, your record has now been heard by 100,000 people for the cost of 50 white labels. The industry changed. And anybody who grew up in the 80s suddenly realised that bands were going straight to number one. No one had heard of them. They weren't being played on the radio. And they had some strange name. There was nobody in the videos and they had no idea who these people were. All this had happened by the 80s. So those of you who shouted at me saying, you know, was downloading and streaming. No, this had happened before the 80s. Right. So the next thing that I think, the third nail in the coffin, also emerges in 1981, is MTV. Right, so MTV was a, was just sitting there waiting to happen, right? Um, <clears throat> if we go back to Dylan, and I've always cited Dylan as being such a genius for the creation of rock music. In the early, uh, mid-60s, when he brought out some terrain in Homesick Blues, he creates a little black and white film to go with that. And it's iconic, and it's, he's got the lyrics, and he's just flopping them down to the ground. That is a groundbreaking video. It's not like watching The Girl Can't Help It and seeing Eddie Cochran on stage because there's still the pretense that he's playing. Dylan's not doing that on that video. He's doing something else. It's a piece of cinema. It's a piece of film. All right, and from that, we get the idea, and I'm sure the people have done it, and I'm sure he shouts at me, but if we just take the idea of creating a small film that can be shown that will also market your record, it can be shown on the television, right? You don't now have to go and market it by going from town to town playing live, right? You could just hit a million people on the television like this, right? Now, um, in the, throughout the 70s, a lot of the pop music shows were still live shows. If you think of Soul Train in America, or you think of Top of the Pops in the UK, what you have there is live bands getting up and playing. Now, sometimes they put on the pretense of playing, but um, sometimes, um, and that would be a video, where they'd be miming, or some film from a live show, bands started to create little films, you know. Um, the ubiquitousness of rock music in the 70s meant there was a whole bunch of mainstream films coming out that featured pop music and rock music. We could think of Tommy an example. We could also think of Saturday Night Fever as an example. And people went and they could see John Travolta jumping up and down to a record and thinking, this is really enjoyable. I don't need to see the band. Right? So bands start to create these videos. Now, these videos, uh, uh, it's like free content. So it's pretty obvious. Why don't you just set up a channel that shows these videos all all day long. The, the, the record companies will give us the video because um, they want to promote their band and thus MTV is born, right? But then once MTV emerges, it shifts the cultural backdrop again. Now, it's for two reasons. Firstly, um, the most obvious reason is that now if you're signing an act, you know they're going to have to be in a video, right? So you're now signing people not on their musical ability, but on their charisma or their looks. Now, of course, that had always been there. Of course, Elvis Presley was the personification of that. But actually, with the advent of the Beatles and Bob Dylan uh, and a whole host of bands in the 60s, um, that sort of um, real personness, right, that sort of charisma that the Beatles brought in, just some cheeky chaps, you know, not necessarily the best looking people in the world, but they were entertaining and funny. Um, that had become a thing, right? And when you watch um, early videos from the 1980s, that's still there, right? And there was always the want to sign people who look cool. That's always been there. But with MTV, it puts that up first, right? Our ears are our super sense. Our ears are the most emotional of all the senses because we can hear all around us in depth we can hear through walls you know um it, it, it's a powerful sense but the one we rely on to survive are our eyes okay and so we'll always judge everything with our eyes right me as a youtuber i know i have to get the title right which is your eyes you read that and i have to get the thumbnail right and if i can get that right people go oh that's interesting and then they click on the eyes always come first. And so the videos realise that if they put good looking people up on, on, on the video, people will look. And that emerges. And then we see in the 80s artists like Madonna emerge that are going to utilise that to push themselves forward. Now it's actually quite shocking the sort of um, um, sexualization that you see in modern 
pop videos which are children are watching, you know, that is the obvious important thing. The labels are now signing people based upon their charisma and their looks. But another thing that doesn't get mentioned so much about MTV, if you're signing a band now, the budget is not going to go on the album. Albums always cost money, but they cost nowhere near what it was to make a little film. So suddenly that gets factored into making, you know, uh, the record. And the, um, the, the spectacle of creating that video becomes the most important bit. I know plenty of bands that were selling records and they were successful and then their label decided to try and push them and say, you know, you've got a British band, we're going to push them in the States, let's form, you know, film a video. And they, they fil filmed that video, it costs a quarter of a million quid and it clears the band out, the band's successful. That, and in some cases that video didn't do anything because the band still had its grassroots live, let's get out and play, you know, it still had that fan base. But suddenly they're a quarter of a million quid in debt to the label and they can't clear it. And so um, this makes it, um, it skews it. It skews the sort of artists you want to sign. And the ones that are successful are the ones that are great at um, creating spectacle. You know, we could cite Michael Jackson here. Now, Michael Jackson was an incredibly talented musician, an incredible singer. But he also was brilliant at manipulating uh, the media around him. This is something that never gets said about Michael Jackson. So many of the stories that we associate with Michael Jackson, not the horrible ones, but say um, him, you know, sleeping in an oxygen tent or the fact that his nose has fallen off, all these things were often per perpetrated by him himself. I know this sounds totally, you know, wrong, but I've done a little bit of research myself. He understood how to manipulate um, the audience and um, he realised that in 1979 when he did Off the Wall he was now the biggest black artist in the world. MTV was not playing black artists at that time. That is because of the history of white rock and roll rock bands, Led Zeppelin, Beatles, all that. You know, black music is seen as being under here. Black musicians have been able to get more of a foothold because of disco, because obviously they, that, they, their image wasn't as important, like I've said. But Michael Jackson realises that he can't get on MTV, right? Uh, the first black artist to be played on MTV is actually Herbie Hancock, and that was because it was an instrumental tune, Rocket, and uh, because he, he, we didn't figure that much in the video. Once MTV put that on, it was like the damn breaks as it should and so now Michael Jackson comes in but what we see with Michael Jackson as the 80s progress he blurs the, the, the divisions quite brilliantly between black and white even bringing a song out entitled black and white and so we see the emergence of, of black artists as, as, as um, pop artists and of course in, in um, Afro-American black music we have this incredible entertainment aspect that, that, that the in terms of being able to put on a show and uh, you know dance routines tightness you know think about the James Brown band compared to the sort of visual performance of a Led Zeppelin lots of posturing and you know and trouser work with Led Zeppelin yes but James Brown you know as suddenly that emerges we get people like Prince and Michael Jackson so there is a skewing popular music towards wider forms, soul, funk, R&B, you know, that becomes the pop music of the 1980s, right? As I have said on, the, on a video that I have filmed, which is, uh, goes into detail in this one aspect, and I'm not going to labour it too here, but at number four, I do have Live Aid. Now, what's interesting about Live Aid, a couple of things I didn't say on the video, because I wanted to really explore some deep, deep aspects and probably didn't state the obvious about Live Aid. If you watch Live Aid, for some reason, and it was probably because of their exclusion from the mainstream at that time, this little subtle exclusion that was still, still there. But the great black artists of that time, like Prince and Michael Jackson, Lionel Richie, um, they're not there. What we see is rock music has suddenly become the establishment. And they're very young. These rock bands are still young, you know, and Led Zeppelin get up in there, you know, how old would um, Rob, Robert's still in his 30s, you know, Robert and Jimmy... Jimmy's um, 40, I think, at that time. So, um, the, what we see with Live Aid is the 
is the establishment of the rock establishment. And they're now no longer seen as countercultural. They're seen as being um, part of this sort of worthy elite that are going to save the world, right? And I think that's a, a, a division where rock music passes from being the, the music of youth, the music of counterculture, of experimentation. It mo moves towards being this established, you know, hard rock cafe, rock and roll hall of fame, um, elites of Mount Olympian legendary characters. Now, so many people pushed back against me. They said Led Zeppelin were legends in the 70s. No, they weren't. They were an obscure band that young people liked, and those young people worshipped that band, right? But they weren't seen by the culture as somebody who would stand up in front of the President of the United States of America and put a medal around their neck, like some character at The Wizard of Oz, which is exactly what that scene looks like when Led Zeppelin go up to take that um, thing from uh, Barack Obama and to see these... Um, was it Barack Obama? Which, which president was it? I can't remember. See, I can't even remember the president, but I can remember Led Zeppelin. Led Zeppelin are more important than the president of the United States of America. That's, that's the way it is. They're legends. They're legends that need to be hallowed. You know, if they've walked across the ground now, we should we should put a little sign uh, over over this. Um, I heard. Oh, I can't tell you that story. It's it's, uh, it's too close to home. Um, let's move on. Let's get on to the next thing on the list. The next thing I've got on the list at number five is grunge. Yes, grunge. Nirvana, Soundgarden, Pearl Jam. Right, now, why have I put that on the list? That is rock music, and it was brilliant. Surely Nirvana came back and brought rock music back to the masses, didn't he? And it all became popular again. Well, if you look throughout the 80s, the 80s is splitting, right? We're getting the emergence of some, the very exciting pop music that we had in the early 80s is really atrophying. It's really becoming middle of the road. Rock music has become middle of the road. It's Bon Jovi and it's all those sort of hair metal bands and Kiss and all that type of stuff. And there's an undercurrent that's gone down through thrash metal, through punk, through indie music, in, 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 in industrial music, experimental music, all this type of stuff. That's going underneath. And... Uh, Towards the end of the 80s, early 90s, there is a little explosion. It's a little bit like the 1960s. You know, dance music, which as I said, is just this esoteric music form just toddling along in the nightclubs, suddenly splits and we see like the emergence of drum and bass and, and two-step and garage and, and, and big beat and, and trip hop and all these things suddenly emerge out of uh, dance music. We see with rap, hip-hop, throughout the 80s, hip-hop, rap's been sort of like a comedy form of music on the whole suddenly we get you know um ice cube and, and uh, nwa and ice t and public enemy and suddenly hip-hop becomes an art form it becomes uh something that's really is countercultural, and that emerges by the 90s there's incredible things going on between hip-hop and jazz and hip-hop and progressive rock and all these things are emerging that's incredible stuff and rock music right seems to take a, a detour and um, the grunge bands are out and out rock bands, but they start to pull in them from a wider remit than just heavy rock or heavy metal, hair metal. They're, they're against that, that stuff. And it's very nihilist. It's very, it, it really, again, goes back to um, channeling a certain nihilism that certain te teenagers have, okay? And for me, when I look at especially heavy rock, heavy metal, after Nirvana, we get bands like Rage Against the Machine. There's Pantera. I love all these bands. Um, there is Korn. Then Linkin Park. And rock music seems to atrophy at that point. Now, I'm going to do a video on grunge because I'm going to do a video on all these things and get into the details of it. And I haven't actually worked out what it is in grunge that was like that spanner in the wheels of rock that suddenly made it go oh, gunk, gunk, and just stop. And so what you have now, especially with heavy rock, heavy metal, that form's dead, right? If you're going to make a heavy rock, heavy metal um, album now, you have to follow the rules. It has to do a whole bunch of certain things. If you don't do it, it will be cast out of the rock and roll, the rock, heavy rock thing, right? That's the bottom line. 
And, um, you know, so I coach people who are trying to make it heavy metal albums. And I'm saying, you know, you're going to have to do this. And you're going to have to do this production thing. It's got to sound like this. The radios won't play it if it does this. You've got to make sure you look like this. Blah, blah, blah. The whole thing. And what I mean by that is if you take any of the subgenres of rock music, heavy rock music now, and you put look at a new album that's coming out, it's very easy to go back 25, 30 years and hear a band doing exactly the same thing exactly the same thing it's moved on in the last 20 years hardly at all now of course there are rock bands doing all these exciting things but it's, it's in the weeds this is not the mainstream anymore it's not nirvana so i haven't explored this more i know i will come back to this but i have put grunge on there it's a marker of the the, the end of creative rock music right and the beginning of the sort of commercialization as of rock music as an expression of sort of um middle class teenage angst i'll make it worse sorry white middle class teenage angst the commercialization of that so what have i got at number six digital audio recording and production techniques right now if we actually go back to Nirvana and we go back to Soundgarden and we go back to Rage Against the Machine and you go and look at your Rick Beato videos you will find out that those records have exactly the same snare drum and exactly the same bass drum on all those records because the producers that were working had look, worked out how to trigger sounds and replace sounds right and that starts to emerge even before digital recording techniques come out now digital recording actually um, that emerges late 70s, early 80s, you know. Um, but even by the early 90s, people are still recording on tape. But as the 90s progress, as, as once everything goes digital, what's now, what is digital? Digital is the, um, um, it's the reduction of music to numbers. So let's really get our head around this, you know. You're, you are watching and listening to numbers, right? So if I get, somebody playing you know vivaldi string quartet and i stick two microphones and i record those into a digital um recording machine it is encoding those sounds as numbers as zeros and ones if i then by hand typed out all those zeros and ones so that's not the music that's just zeros and ones and then i put that into a file that, uh, uh, that um, a, a digital encoder could read and turn back into music, out of the speakers would come an exact carbon copy of the sound before, right? Uh, digital, digital, um, digital audio can replicate perfectly and it can re replicate very quickly a million times over. These are things about digital recording. We just saw it as being high quality, but there's other aspects to it. And once you've got numbers, you can reprocess numbers. And, and a computer can take numbers and turn it into something else. So from that, with someone singing out a tune, we can put them into tune. But we can also get them to sing a different tune. We can change the quality of their voice, right? We, we can now have... Um, drum samples that sound like real drummers because the the maths can be worked out go what's the drummer doing how much how much sort of inaccuracy do i want does a drummer have to make it sound like it's groove and we can replace sounds and um the the advent of digital audio recording techniques meant that suddenly uh, rock bands are no longer you're no longer listening to the rock band what you're listening to is a program drum machine now they might have done this in a very clever way they might have got the drummer in the room and he's played through and they've mic'd it all up but those mics are now re-triggering a drum sound it's not the real drum sound and say the drummer made a mistake so we'll just can fix that mistake there they made a mistake then we'll fix that mistake there but throughout it all they're all a little bit out of time it's all a bit wobbly it's got quite a nice screw but why don't we just quantize it all which means we put everything in time so now we listen to what the drummer played but it's been computerized um it, from, the computer has tied it to a grid exactly right and you're no longer listening to the sounds but you listen to what the drummer did but you're not really because they did a lot more sort of detail for that verse and we just copy and paste it before you know it the division between a real drummer and what you're hearing on record has gone right if you're hearing a real drummer that's because the producer has decided to let you hear a real drummer 
This is entirely true of a guitar, bass and all that. People no longer use amps, there's no recording of the air. They plug their guitar into a machine and it takes that clean sound. And then it, it can emulate an amp, it, it can emulate um, a, a mic in a room. There's no air moving anymore. And if the guitarist make, makes a mistake, you could go in and correct it. You know, when I put my guitar solos in on my albums, um, years and years ago, if I was doing a guitar solo, I'd have to keep doing takes. I'd be playing, the, oh, I've hit a bum no, oh, maybe I can drop that, it's going to ruin it, I'll start again. Now, I just do my solo and maybe I hit three bum notes throughout the solo. I just ignore it and so I can just go in, pick on that note, it's out of tune, and I just move it so it's in tune. Right, I could speed myself up if I wanted. I could uh, I could make it sound more um, flowing. I could make my technique sound better. I could do it to a bass player and singers. It's not um, you know auto tune is not something that puts you in tune. You could create the vocal if somebody's if someone spoke the words. You could use the vocal plugins to turn that into a song, make it sound like somebody else to harmonise against itself. And of course, the big thing is once AI comes in, AI is now able to go, well, I can come up with that bass line for you if you want. I can come up with that drum machine for you. In fact, I can probably write a song like this. Right? The, we are now so removed of the technology of the rock band, the requirement to have that in the studio to make the music. We don't need it anymore. Digital audio techniques is by far, I think, the biggest, you know, nail in the coffin for rock music. We just, you do not need a rock band anymore. If a producer decides to use a live drummer on a record, it's a luxury. It's like bringing in a harpist, right? These are no longer the central instruments of popular music. The central instrument is the digital audio workstation. Of course, as I said, um, once you've got digital um, music, you can replicate that Replicate that in an instant. You know, we were all, come on, we all moan about this, but we were copying music. You know, in the old days, we used to listen to, you know, I would listen to a record all the way through. I, 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 you know, the album was so important. Yeah, but how many of those are on cassette tape that you recorded off your friends? Remember home taping is killing music? <laughs> Remember that? But you had to put the record on. Someone had to buy at least one record to do it. And then you had to put the record on. And then you had to hit record and sit there while it recorded the whole thing. Then turn the tape over, do that, and then record it again. You know, and it, and it was great because a C90, you could get two albums on a cassette tape and you were sorted. I spent hours recording stuff on tape. You know, when I do my list and I'm talking about certain albums, so many of these albums I never actually owned. So if I take a band like Yes, I... I had the first Yes album. I didn't have time in a word, but I had it on tape. I, uh, I got the Yes album. I got Fragile. I would got Close to the Edge. I would got um, Tales from Topographic Ocean. But I never owned a copy of Relaya. Right? I never owned a copy of Going for the One. I had those, both of those, on a cassette tape. I wore it out. Going for the One it could well be my favourite Yes album. Tomato, I had a list. I didn't even bother recording it. Um, drama. I think I had a copy of that on tape. I think I only had I only had them the one track off there. Right. So <laughs> this is always going on. Everybody was doing it throughout the history of rock music, but sat now you can just go and you've got a perfect copy. You know, not tape to tape. You know, have you got a cassette of that album? Yeah. Is it tape to tape? Oh, was, you know, <laughs> it it can replicate audio instantly and it can re replicate it a million times right so at that point the recording music industry the thing that created all this the thing that created rock remember i said at the start there's always been popular music but what we're talking about specifically is the music that emerged through the invention of recording and the development of the recorded music industry once downloading um happened you could no longer make any money out of physical product beyond the actual physical product itself and I will come to that at some point it's an interesting uh, concept that is uh, so um, the record companies don't move fast enough when it comes to downloading uh, they they have pushed their CDs CDs cost less to make than an album but they push the price up so people are paying a lot of money for a CD and then suddenly um, you get File sharing come out in Napster. 
And what this means is, is that you can basically, you know, grab a torrent file and grab the whole catalog of a whole, whole um, band. Um, I, when I discovered Gentle Giant, the progressive rock band Gentle Giant, which I was very late to, and I'm very ashamed to admit this, but when I discovered Gentle Giant, it was the time when the whole torrent file sharing thing has happened. So I heard a Gentle Giant, I thought, this is great. And rather than going out and buying a CD or maybe getting a CD and recording onto tape and listening to it, I went, oh, this is interesting, but, and I can remember going on and grabbing a torrent file. And when I got up the next morning, I had everything. Absolutely everything by Gentle Giant. I started to work my way through it. Any members of Gentle and Giant watching this, I apologise greatly for doing this, but I remember I did it. We all did it, right? Um, at that point, the value of the recording, right, has gone. So the idea that you're going to put a real band into a studio with a million quid's worth of gear, with a top producer, and get a sound out of them. The idea that that's, that is how we're going to make records. No, now you need to make records in your bedroom. You've got to bring the cost down. To be able to get the cost back, you've got to get the cost down. Right? It's more than just the fact that it knocks out the record buying public that now they're listening to, um, you know, uh, you know, everything online and downloading stuff and they've got their little iPod with all the whole record collection on, you know. It's more than just that. It's also, it favours certain types of music. Um, I've spoken about this at such length and I'm sure I will again. I want to actually move on to what I've got at number eight. At number eight, I have Britney Spears, right? Um, I found that the 90s was a really exciting time for music. Um, I felt that rock music was still alive. I didn't realise it was dying, you know, but we'd entered that list into, you know, Nirvana and Soundgarden and Pearl Jam and then Rage Against the Machine and I was listening to Pantera and I was listening to, you know, a whole host of really interesting metal bands. It, it started to get samey as the nineties come on, but it didn't matter because you'd had bands like Radiohead emerge and then in, here in the UK, I wasn't a massive fan of it, but at least you'd got like sort of Britpop, Oasis and Blur and they were bands and they were going to number one. It all seemed all great, didn't it? Throughout the 90s, they were still rock bands, they were still selling. Then suddenly, I can remember looking at the charts in 1999 and this little teenage girl had gone straight to number one. And at that point in time, that Hit Me Baby One More Time record, which had in it, and it's a brilliant song. We all, can, we all know it's a great song. And we know when we hit, hear those early Britney Spears songs. Who, is it, who wrote those? Is it Max Martin or somebody like that? You know that he got a background, or at least my ears tell me, he got a background in rock bands. This were, these were rock songs. It sounded like Europe. You know the band, you know, the final countdown. All these, uh, these sort of teeny bopping people that emerged in the 90s like Britney Spears, you know, Christine Aguilera, it all sounds a little bit like Europe, can final count down to me. That's just my own personal, you know, view on it. Anyway, so they were like rock songs. Hit Me Baby Bob Tom could be played by a rock man. This wasn't like the, the later emergence of sort of hip-hop and, and, and electronic dance music that then takes over pop music. But, um, and I'm going around the subject, because I do think it's a great song, right? Mm. But it's been made by the machines. Britney Spears, it's all about her look. It's all about what she represents. She grabs a market which had laid dormant that Oasis never had, which was the market of teenage, of early teens, like we're talking 10-year-old, 11-year-old girls. She comes in and grabs that market, right? And suddenly, it was as though at that point, the industry goes, right, let's, just, let's move over to that. And by the early 2000s, a formula that's come out um, and it's gone back to the sort of teen sensation, singing a song that's written by somebody else and produced somebody else that, it, that had happened be before rock and roll emerged and rock music emerged. At that point, it was dead. Right? And pop music, it's like, if you go, if you look at what popular music is like after Britney Spears, it's pretty much the same thing. The, it, it's grown with the, the more ubiquitous influence of hip hop. And hip hop has, has gone from being a really high art form, in my opinion, to dropping down, you know, to quite a wretched level of just awful commerciality. You know, um, albeit under the surface, there's some incredible artists, Kendrick Lamar's an incredible artist, and I, I, I'm 
there's still great stuff going on. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying there's a general trend down. And um, but the big frightening thing is that it hasn't really changed. You know, um, I just think the songwriting's got poorer. <laughs> I have got, you know, bands like NSYNC and, um, you know, uh, uh, God, I'm, I'm out of my depth here, aren't I? Um, but some of those records, like Destiny's Child would be one, um, Who Did Waterfalls, um, uh, Lisa Left Eye Lopez, what was that band? <laughs> now I sound like a granddad, I can't even remember pop bands from 20 years ago. And it's probably not 20 years ago, it's probably something like 25 years ago, but the point is, those were great, I loved all that. It was great. So, so you have the semblance of reasonable songwriting, but this, I feel the songwriting has really descended down to. It's not bad. The producers know what they're doing. It's just it's really descended to its lowest common denominator. And rock music has become some esoteric, you know, form that's over in the corner. You know, you've got legacy bands going around playing, you know, to you know that the, where they were once doing stadiums, they now play to four or five hundred people in various venues, holding on to it. You know, that that, that that's all. That's what we've got going on. So, uh, Britney, again, I, I put two artists in. I put, like, Nirvana in the whole grunge thing at the beginning of the 90s, and I got Britney Spears at the end of the 90s. It's that travel. That really is, a, you know, the death stab to rock music. Um, number nine, I've put streaming. People always put these downloading and streaming together. But streaming is... It, streaming comes along and goes, downloading... You know, downloading, and it kills downloading, right? It kills downloading. They're not together at all. You know, I, I have my albums on um, uh, Bandcamp, and Bandcamp mo Bandcamp's model is great because you can go and stream it and you get nothing, right? You stream my track, say, three times, and it'll turn around and say, you know, why don't you pay to pay to stream this artist, right? That model could have worked, but you can also download my album, and you have to pay for that. So when you pay for an album, you get you get um, um, eternal streaming, but you also get a physical copy of the album, which you can then put on somewhere and play in your car if your car can't play stuff off the album. All that stuff. It's all going. I mean, it's down, downloading's dead. It's you know why would you want to download a record? I still download stuff. Because um, in my car, I can't access the internet, so I've got a memory stick, and I down. This is this is the awfulness of it. I used to go and sit in a room with two great big speakers in, and all my vinyl LPs lined up, and I'd pull one out, right, and I'd put it on and sit there with my cup of tea and do that and listen to the record. That's how, how I used to listen to music, and you probably all think I do, but I'm a, I'm a I'm a grown man. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a grown middle aged man. I don't have time to do that. I can't do that now. The only time I've got to listen to music is in the car. So I download stuff and I stick it on a memory stick and I put it in the guitar or I play my old CDs in the car. And it seems so much easier to bang a CD in than be in a car. I mean, my mates can he can get Spotify, but he's having to push all these buttons unless he says, you know, hey Siri, play something by Black Sabbath. You know, <laughs> I don't know. It's all we're all old, right? We're all old, and this comes to number 10, the last one on the list. The last one on my list is death. <laughs> right, we're all getting old. It's, it's like the natural, I'm discussing death. This is about death. That's what this is really about. It's about the metaphorical use of rock music to personify the passage of our lives. From the visceral, you know, um, teenage, rebellious, fun-loving people that we were once many years ago, through that sort of, you know, coming to adulthood and the, and the, and the play of all these intellectual ideas and then the realisation you can't change the world and you go back to disco and you just go down that fun but you've still got this nostalgia and there's the live aid thing. And it's, it's, it's a mirror for what we are. You know, I'm 56 years old. You know, some of the people who are putting comments on my channel are saying, I'm 75 years old, I'm 80 years old, right? Now, um, I used to play in a band called Quill. Quill are quite a well-known band here in the UK, in the Midlands. Anyone in Birmingham, the Midlands will know Quill. Nobody else knows Quill. But it was a great band. And because it had such a big fan base locally, we had used to do some really nice gigs. It used to do some really great gigs. When COVID happened, that band shut down. And then when the band emerged, 
a couple of years later we got back out our audience that were old we became aware that some of them had died in that period now I'm trying not to laugh about this but I cannot help but find this funny is that um, this whole thing that we're holding on to this rock thing in the end at a certain point we'll all be dead <laughs> and there'll be no one to buy the albums and nobody to go to the gigs will it have passed on to the young people of course it won't be in the same way as we, you know people who grew up with rock and roll weren't listening to you know Rudy Valley and, and Ivan Novella records you know two names that were like ubiquitous in the 1930s and now nobody's heard of you know can we imagine a world where Led Zeppelin nobody knows who they are where Led Zeppelin are a band, you know, where somebody would be walking through Redditch one day and they would come up against the John Bonham sculpture that's there and they would go, what's that? I don't know, it's like some person from the past. Well, who is it? Oh, it, 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 that says he was a drummer in a band called Led Zeppelin, right? That's the same as walking through, you know, a town and finding some sculpture for someone. And what did this put? Oh, he, he owned a factory that made carpets. Oh, and they got, he's got his statue. What's his name? Never heard of him. Oh, we're going to end up. Is that the final death? All these. Now, I, I think the John Bonham um, monument in Redditch is wonderful. And I was actually a little bit involved in the creation of that very small, very small part. I'm very proud of that. But around the world, there are all these awful monuments to various rock artists, aren't they? And they all look like Han Solo in in um, which one is it? Is it in Empire Strikes Back when he gets he gets um, <laughs> you know that that thing when he gets encased in that stuff, that brown stuff? What's it called? Come on, Proggers! You, I've got Star Wars question here. And I, I, I do know the answer to this, but I can't actually. Oh, this is getting tough. So we're getting old. What what's it's not kryptonite, is it? That's the thing that Superman doesn't uh, like. Carbon, do you get carbonized? No, that's what you do with lemonade, isn't it? Anyway, you know when Han Solo gets trapped in that thing, that to me is what many monuments to rock artists look like to me. And uh, can you imagine the time where someone's walking through and they find a statue to Rory Gallagher and go, "Who the hell is this? What is this about?" And can you imagine in the future where things that rock stars got up to are seen as being so horrifically terrible as all our British industrialists that had, con had links to the slave trade? And who'd have thought that all these progressive types would be ripping these statues down? Now, can you imagine in the future that something else has been like delineated as being the worst moral thing you could possibly do maybe all the activities maybe the post gig activities that these guys got up to in the 70s and it's really that's really been emerged after they've died and it's all been said these were terrible people you really shouldn't listen to these people because it's so terrible what they did and then you have a blight of people you know um you know uh, ripping down statues to these people can you imagine that I won't say what statues there. So death, death is going to come to us all. It's the final one and it's happening right now. And it's incredible, you know, that, you know, every month I could be on here saying, oh, the, the um, who, who was, who's, who's been the last, and I haven't done a video about this guy. And, uh, I, I, and this is how terrible it is. I've got a progressive rock YouTube here. Can are one of the most important progressive rock bands in his history and Damo Suzuki died a couple of days ago I found out when I went to bed now I'm not a huge expert on Khan their influence is ubiquitous it's incredible you know and they had an influence of progressive rock music electronic music indie music and even punk it's such an important band Damo Suzuki is such an important artist I think he was 74 years old he got colon cancer um, and he died recently Right, these are the these are the people that made this music. They're dying, they're dying. So, I'm coming up now to an hour on the death of rock music. The ten nails in the coffin 
I've only just opened up the book. I want to explore this more because I think it's the elephant in the room of my channel, this is. It needs to be discussed. I'm going to be going into these in more details and all other things. I'm going to be exploring this idea. And also, I, 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 I've gone through this. Please realise that my videos are a bit nuanced. If you were to say, do you think rock music's dead? I'd go, I don't know. From one aspect, you can see it's dead. But on other aspects, you could say it's not dead at all. Because blah, blah, blah. And one of the things would be the emergence of vinyl records. People, the kids are buying vinyl records. And of course, once you start to buy vinyl records, you've got to have Dark Side of the Moon. You've got to have Led Zeppelin 4. You've got to have Sergeant Pepper. And there's a resurgence there. And the very thing that created this thing, going right back to the beginning, which is recording music, right? That product... Anyone who's buying the album now, they are now, have I got a record here that I can pull out? So I'm going to hold something in my hand. Yes, I've got a Stanley Clark album. So as I hold this album here, I don't need to put this on to listen to it anymore, right? Because I could go and listen to it online. It's better quality online because mine's a bit scratchy because it's been bent and it's a bit worn. It's like, this is like 35 years old, this copy. But I'm not going to get rid of this as he tried to get the creases out because this is my copy of School Days by Stanley Clark and I love it. It's got the great Ray Gomez on guitar. It's one of my favourite guitarists of all time. You know, this is special to me. The very thing itself, the cardboard. You know, the, 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 inner su the, the surprise that you get when you open up there. Look at that. When, when, when people bought records and what, rec what records could I have bought? It's trying to sell me ABBA. Bruce Springsteen, The Clash, Earth, Wind and Fire, Marty Robbins, Johnny Cash, Tammy Winnett, Janis Joplin, Judas Priest, Art Garfunkel, Bob Dylan, Billy Joel, Barbara Streisand, Miles Davis, Simon and Garfunkel, Santana, Boston, Shaking Stevens. Shaking Stevens. Brilliant. Anyway, I've come to the end of the video. But we'll stop there. I've done my bit. So... If you like this video, like it. So get 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 your finger or your mouse down. Don't don't not do it and ignore it. Go and put a like on it. It won't hurt you, but it will benefit me. Go and press it. Yeah, thank you very much. That'll help. That's good. Thank you for doing that. If you didn't do that, you mean bad person, right? If you want to know, see more videos. Now you might have hated this video and you didn't like what I was like and you sort of talked too much. Talk for an hour on what I'm wittering on. Then don't subscribe. But if you want to see more of my particular way of doing this, then Again, finger subscribe. Now, if you've been watching a few of my videos and you want to support me because you're a wealthy person, you want to share your wealth to someone like me who hasn't got so much money, there's two ways you could share your wealth and feel better about yourself. One would be to become a patron. And by doing that, you get tons more content, tons more Andy Edwards, and a lot more than just videos. There's all sorts of things. And you get access to the patron meet, which I do every now and then, try to do about two a month. And uh, I'm just about to... Um, organize a new one of those so then we've got the patron meet then if you don't want to do that because you haven't got the time because you're a busy person of a certain age you could put a donation into my patron tip door now I, i've got to be serious here at the moment this is what i'm living on <laughs> at the moment certain things have happened to me in my personal life which i think will eventually come out i can't mention them here too much but i am living on that at the moment so i am very very grateful and i cannot believe that the lo my love of this music and my enjoyment in talking about it is is um uh, has ended with people supporting me and i am so eternally grateful to them and um i i i can't say what that means but uh and i have to say at the end of the video it feels like you're begging but we live in a different world now with the commodity and music has to be supported in a different way and um i do thank you for doing that so i've done all my bit end of the video thanks for watching i'm gonna see you around. i'm gonna switch it off now bye bye Hello there, this is just a quick video to let you know that I'm going to be doing a drum clinic and masterclass for the guys over at Drummers Link on Thursday the 22nd of February 2024 and it's in a partnership with my incredible symbol company Dream Symbols. you can see those beautiful symbols in the background. Um, the links if you want to get a ticket are in the description for this video and I'm sure they are on the screen right now. Um, there's going to be me and a whole host of incredible drummers 
from top level bands, you know, pro drummers that are going to be coming in and sharing their wisdom. And this isn't just going to be a sit there and watch somebody show off. There's going to be actual involvement. You're going to get, learn new skills, get, gain new knowledge. It's really going to involve the audience. Um, I don't know what the other guys are doing, but what I'm going to be looking at in my masterclass is the full stroke, which I believe is the fundamental technique on which all other techniques are based. I'll be looking at the full stroke in terms of the uh, hands on a practice pad or snare drum, and I'll also be looking at the full stroke in terms of the, uh, the bass drum, bass drum pedal. So if you want to be able to get a beautiful sound out of your kit, if you want to be able to play in a relaxed way and be able to get all that speed and control that everyone's after, that's what I'm going to be looking at in my masterclass. Um, on the evening, I will be doing a drum clinic where I'll be playing through some, you know, pretty difficult, uh, proggy, sort of on time signature of madness and explain how I approach some of that as well. So, um, the if you want the ticket for the whole day, um, you can get a masterclass ticket and Q&A sessions um, for £45. If you just want to come to the evening drum clinic, the ticket's £25. So it's roughly the cost of a drum lesson. And I tell you, you're going to get so much more than just what you would have got from a normal drum lesson. So I hope this has piqued your interest. And if you are interested in coming, here it is. There's the link again. And uh, please, you know, get yourself a ticket. Come along, say hello. And I will be looking forward to seeing you, plus all my drummer friends, um, at the Dream um, Dream Symbols Drummers Link Clinic and Masterclass on the 22nd of February 2024. Oh, I've had to impart a lot of information in a short amount of time here. So I, have, have I got everything done? I think so. Anyway, I'm done. I'll see you there.